Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Survive and Thrive webinar series. We are so glad to have you all here. Today, we're going to have Sage Bolte discussing sexual health after cancer. And I know that's a, a, a topic that we often have folks asking about, and so we're really grateful to have Sage here today. The Texas Oncology Foundation, as most of you know, is dedicated to providing patient support and education to patients and, and caregivers where they live, work, and receive treatment. And through our Survive and Thrive series, we this is where we find and build our community and provide resource and education on a number of topics and issues that affect you on your cancer journey. So I am gonna go over a few housekeeping items and then I'm gonna introduce Sage so that we can get started. Um, we cannot see you or hear you. You can see us and you can hear us, but um, we cannot hear anything from attendees. If you're having technical difficulties, the best solution is typically to exit um, and then rejoin the webinar. And if you're experiencing audio issues, you can always dial in and listen in to the conversation. Um, Please feel free. This is what, what's most exciting about our webinar series, I think, is that you get to ask the experts anything you have on this topic. So please be um, active in chat with any questions you have, and we will get to those. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be available online, and we'll get you the link on where to find that. So I am going to take just a second to introduce Sage. Dr. Sage Bolte is the Chief Philanthropy Officer and President at Innova Health Foundation, and she's a certified sex therapist. In 2010, she obtained her PhD in social work, where her dissertation explored the impact of cancer and its, uh, treat and its treatments on the sexual self of young adult cancer survivors. So we are really excited to hear uh, from you on this topic today. So Sage, without further ado, let's hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks so much and good morning everyone. I am here in the DC region um, joining you virtually. This is, you know, the plus side of COVID has been, we've learned how to do this virtual world from all over the, the country or countries or world. So it's so great to be with you all. Um, as Natalie said, please use the chat feature um, to ask questions throughout the, the conversation. I hope this feels a little bit like a conversation. Um, and then we'll take questions at the end, but if there's something really pressing, um, one, either Natalie or one of the team members uh, will interrupt me and ask a question during this. So we're just gonna dive right in. Again, I hope this is um, information that is helpful and supportive. It's a short period of time. Sometimes I do these for three or four hours, so we're gonna talk fast. I'm gonna dial into my East Coast fast language and try to get, get through these slides quickly. When, um, when we talk about um, sexual health, you know, we, we absolutely understand that being diagnosed with cancer is a life-altering experience. It doesn't just affect physically how your body looks um, for some or emotionally how you feel, um, but it can affect all aspects of your life. And for many people, um, sexual health may not be something that is thought of at the very beginning of treatment because you're just focused on um, what we might call the Charlie Brown syndrome, right? You hear you have cancer and then it's kind of wah, 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 wah. You don't hear anything after that. Um, but as the dust settles, as you start to um, gain some semblance of normal uh, back in your life or as treatments become more familiar, the awareness of the changes um, that occur because of cancer treatments become more prominent. One of those um, challenges that often we don't recognize enough is just that cancer is full of losses. It is full of gains in many ways, but there are there are a lot of losses. And one of those losses, not only the loss of feeling like you're out of control and finding ways to gain control, but there is a loss of a sense of, um, uh, of confidence in your body. And that can contribute to some of the challenges that people face related to their sexual health. And we know that sexuality and intimacy are critical pieces of quality of life. In fact, they rate in the top 10 um, challenges that people face um, in survivorship as well as during treatment. So at the end of today, what we hope you will walk away with is to be able to identify at least two common sexual health 
challenges that cancer survivors face, identify at least two strategies to, a, to address a sexual health challenge, and understand what professionals you or your loved one can seek for additional support. I will use the words sexual health and sexual self intermittently, and I purposely um, don't use the word sexuality as often because I feel like the word sexuality often gets limited or boxes people into only this idea of how I identify. Am I um, a, a white heterosexual woman? Right. Instead of our sexual health, which is much more encompassing our sexual self, which is much more encompassing of who we are as complicated beings, that the way we think about our sexual bodies can impact the way we feel about our sexual bodies, which then impacts the way we behave or interact with ourselves or a partner or partners sexually. And cancer can certainly affect that. If you came into cancer with a good sense of uh, your sexual self, the chances are you will weather through the storm and find ways to creatively work around some of the challenges you face now. And if there are people who have had ongoing challenges um, related to body image or ongoing challenges related to sexual health or potentially a sexual trauma in your past, cancer may exacerbate some of those challenges and affect the way you think about your body, again, which continues to influence the way we feel and our behaviors. We know that um, quality of life, specifically around sexual health, can um, be altered for many years, not just kind of in the first aftermath of, of treatment, but can be two to five years post-cancer diagnosis. And for some, especially for those whose hormones have been affected, can mean a lifetime of change, and yet there are lots of things we can do to address it. We know that the incidence of altered sexuality is high and can persist for many years and can affect the quality of life of not just the person diagnosed with cancer, but also the partner or partners. Um, there may be anxiety or fear around um, engaging in sexual intimacy on the partner's part. There may be um, sadness and grief and loss around the changes um, in the partner's body. All of those things are normal and can affect both partners and those both of those things can affect sexual function, but also the sexual self, how one interprets their sexual body. And we know that this is a broad number, but 10 to 100% of patients will experience some form of sexual dysfunction. As a reminder, sexual dysfunction um, is when there is a kind of a breakdown in what we would anticipate to be a normal sexual response. So whether that's lower libido or lower interest, whether that's erectile disorder, whether that's um, anorgasmia or the inability to have an orgasm, whether there is now painful intercourse, all of those things um, would qualify as sexual dysfunction if they are distressing to you. I also want to normalize that there are people who these um, uh, these challenges are presented to and they're not distressing to them. They find ways to navigate around it or, or don't have it as a priority to be sexually intimate. And so it doesn't necessarily impact them the same way as it might for someone who has it as a priority. We also know that there are certain cancer diagnoses and the treatments related to those cancer diagnoses that have higher rates of um, specifically sexual health and sexual dysfunction uh, concerns associated with it. So we know that people um, post uh, stem cell transplant can complain of um, challenges related to sexual function, often related to hormone changes or hormone imbalance, sometimes related to graft versus host disease that can create painful um, intimacy. Uh, and again, you'll see the list of cancers that there, there are many, and, and not, this is not all encompassing, there are many more that are not captured here where patients uh, would report challenges related to their sexual health or sexual function. So we're going to look a little bit deeper at how specifically cancer can impact relationships in the sexual self. We know that cancers themselves, as I just pointed out, directly impact sexual, and I'm going to talk specifically about sexual function for the moment, um, that a cancer, for example, like prostate cancer, if there's been a prostate removal, that is going to directly impact the ability to maintain and sustain an erection. 
There might be uh, for women who have a gynecological cancer and need removal of, of the female sex organs, that could affect the comfort or discomfort with um, penetrative intercourse and or influence libido or the interest in sex. So there are cancers, again, that directly affect the sex organs that can cause challenges to sexual function and the view or experience of the sexual self. And then there are also um, challenges related to psychological distress. We know that 15 to 25% of those diagnosed with cancer will experience an increase in psychological distress through their cancer journey. And oftentimes, what we do when somebody experiences distress, uh, whether it's anxiety or depression, is we prescribe medication. And many of the medications we prescribe in the what are qual qualified as SSRI categories can further exacerbate um, sexual dysfunction. So it's important to talk to your physician about what medication um, might be available to you that wouldn't further exacerbate your sexual function. The other thing we know influences altered sexuality or sexual function is cancer therapy. We know that chemotherapy itself can affect um, uh, many issues, hair loss, right? So not just again about um, sex itself, but the way we view ourselves. So for some hair loss can be uh, challenging. Uh, we know that for women who are premenopausal, chemotherapy can sometimes throw those women into a menopausal state, causing significant challenges related to libido and comfort with intercourse. Um, we know that uh, cancer therapies can have side effects like neuropathy and um, sores in their mouths. Um, it can specifically uh, affect um, the blood flow. And so all of those things can affect sexual function. We also know that surgery and or radiation to the pelvic area or surgery to the neck or chest can create significant discomfort that also can further exacerbate one's view of um, their sexual body and or sexual function. If you've had radiation to your head and neck, uh, the likelihood of dry mouth, ongoing dry mouth can be really challenging. And most of us in an intimate relationship um, engage in the beginning of a relationship with kissing. And when there is constant dry mouth for some, that is very uncomfortable. It can create challenges related to body image. It can be uncomfortable. So working towards addressing some of those side effects can also help you live uh, more fully in your sexual self and have more positive sexual experiences. And as I said before, alterations in relationships during and following treatment are really common. For some um, who are in a relationship during treatment, they might find that they become stronger than ever. For others, they may feel like they're being broken apart and they've stopped communicating and stopped connecting. And we'll address that a little bit later on. So I wanna specifically uh, just address some of the physiological changes that men and women identify. So we know for men, one of the top complaints is just neurovascular damage resulting in erectile disorder. And this could be from a chemotherapy agent, it could be from radiation to the pelvis, and it could be from surgery. We know that hormone changes is another top concern for men, and it doesn't have to be for men who have had, for example, prostate cancer. Some report changes related to chemotherapy or pituitary gland um, impacted that getting your testosterone levels or your hormone levels checked by an endocrinologist could be very beneficial if you notice significant changes. There is also um, decreased libido associated with lower testosterone. There's higher risks of osteoporosis. And again, some vasomotor flushing that may cause some concern for some men. Other um, concerns is the infertility, the impact that treatments can have on infertility. And although um, infertility and sexuality are not necessarily linked, right? You don't have to be fertile to be a sexual being for some men and women. Um, having their fertility affected affects the way they view themselves as a man or a woman. And so just acknowledging that and working with a therapist through that is really important. Fatigue and decreased st physical stamina for both men and women is a common side effect of treatment. And how does that relate to sexuality and intimacy? It relates a lot. If we're tired all the time, we just don't have energy to be physically intimate, whether that's sexual intercourse or even just cuddling. If that 
feels painful, if your skin's really sensitive, if it's too exhausting. Um, being in a relationship requires energy. And when you are fatigued, you can't put in the same that you might have been able to before you were experiencing fatigue. Even the physical stamina, the ability to um, go on a date, the ability to engage in um, sexual play with yourself or with a partner um, certainly can be impacted when you have significant fatigue or decreased physical stamina. And so finding ways to work around that, talk openly about it is really important. And we know that male children who have been treated for cancer um, in their childhood may experience delayed or absent puberty especially if their pituitary gland was affected as a child. For women, some of the top complaints, again, is um, the challenges related to treatment side effects, chemo brain, joint discomfort, neuropathy, the hair loss. Again, those things can impact the way we view our sexual bodies for both men and women. If we're worried um, that we can't remember specific details and we really um, pride ourselves on our memory, or if we're single and we're dating, and we want to um, remember details that somebody shared with us and we're worried we're not going to. I've heard some of the young adults I've worked with said, I'm, I don't, I don't want to date until that chemo brain is, is fixed because I'm worried that they're going to think I don't care, that it doesn't matter what they're telling me if I can't remember. And so, again, when we think about some of the side effects and how they view our, our impression or interpretation of our sexual self, it's really important to bring this up, either in group setting or with a therapist, to talk through some ways that you might address that. Acute or premature ovarian failure for women, throwing women into menopause and or exacerbating menopausal symptoms is definitely the number one complaint for most women. We also know that surgical or scarring challenges, um, the lymphedema, if there's been removal of lymph nodes, can create um, body image challenges, frustration, discomfort in the body. And we know that for women thrown into the medically induced menopause, there is higher rates of vaginal stenosis or the narrowing of the vaginal canal um, because of vaginal atrophy. Um, that can create discomfort with um, whether it's uh, intercourse uh, with a male partner or with a um, enhancement aid. It can create some pain. Even gynecological exams can be uncomfortable, and we'll talk about how to address that. And again, as I said before, fatigue and decreased physical stamina are often a challenge and complaint for both men and women. We also know that the way we think about ourselves or the way we are interacting with our friends and family, our social and physiological, psychological um, challenges play into our view of our sexual self. One of the things I hear as a sex therapist a lot when people um, show up is, I just, I feel bad that this is even something that I'm worried about. I, I should be worried about whether I live, not whether about what, not, not about whether I'm gonna be sexually satisfied again. And to that I say, you have the right to have the highest quality of life, period. And if if your sexual health is an important part of you and who you are as a being, which I believe it is, um, then it does matter. It really matters. And cancer is a chapter. For many of you, it's a chapter of your life. I know there are people living with chronic and advanced disease. And so finding, again, that sexual self and the ups and downs of what changes and challenges with treatment may be a different journey. For those of you where cancer is, is a chapter, um, again, working through that and not being dismissive of this shouldn't matter, it does matter. The emotional distress, as I mentioned before, some of the body image challenges that people face that are different for everyone, whether that's the weight gain or weight loss caused by many treatments, whether it's um, the scarring, or again, as I mentioned, lymphedema, whether it's changes um, in the way you look, disfigurement. All of those can add to the way that we um, interpret ourselves and the way we interact with our um, intimate partner or partners or future intimate partners or partners. And as I mentioned before, the partner's health, the partner's emotional reaction to a diagnosis is also important um, in this journey together if you are in a partnership, because that certainly does impact your sexual connection as well. So why aren't our doctors talking to us about it? Uh, it's, it's not because um, they don't care. And I, I really wanna reemphasize that. Oftentimes what I find when working with healthcare providers um, is that they're, they're really just focused on getting you treatment, getting you to the end of, of your treatment and getting you off living again. 
And um, so if we're not bringing it up as patients, oftentimes it gets missed. But why aren't we as patients bringing it up? Yes, sometimes it can be embarrassing and there's a stigma associated with it. But I think the saddest thing that this study, and this was done in 1999, it is an old study, but it remains true. A lot of people don't realize that there are treatments that exist that could help address the sexual concerns. And whether that's relational concerns, whether that's body image concerns, or whether that's sexual function concerns, there are treatments to address all of those. So again, high level, I want to talk about what do we do um, as women diagnosed with treatment? What are some of the, the options for improving sexual health and sexual function? First and foremost, you want to address um, your vaginal health, um, and that is really important. So um, it, Addressing it with a technique we call stretch, strengthen, and moisturize is using dilator therapy, which um, looks very similar to a tampon um, that you would use uh, at minimum three times a week, inserted into the, the vagina, that you can um, practice Kegel or Kegel exercises on that allow to strengthen. So if we think about our body um, during treatment, I'm sure many of you experienced muscle atrophy or are experiencing mu muscle atrophy because when we feel fatigued, we don't exercise as much. And there's truth to with muscles, use it or lose it. And the vagina is a muscle. So if it isn't um, continued to be um, strengthened and stretched, it can, the elasticity can lose itself, especially if you've been thrown into medically induced menopause. And so addressing that with a moisturizer, which is different than a lubricant, a lubricant is applied on the outside, typically of the vulva um, or on a, a toy or a penis. Moisturizer is specifically used for moisturizing the inside of the vagina. Um, and there, there is some, a list of, um, ones we recommend that you will get um, at the end of this lecture. Um, there are certainly other options such as vaginal laser therapy, which is um, something like the Mona Lisa treatment. That's an intravaginal um, laser treatment. It's similar to microdermabrasion for the face, but it helps with rebuilding collagen inside the vagina. And there are um, certified physicians who do that treatment. I tend to be biased, and I'm just gonna name that, that um, I work more with gynecologists who do this, although there are some plastic surgeons who do this as well. Um, my, my preference for referrals working with gynecologists just because they really um, understand some of the challenges many of um, young women or women thrown into medically induced menopause experience. Certainly there's hormonal treatment that is available for some women, not all, that can address whether it's the estrin ring, which is a localized low dose um, uh, hormone treatment put inside the vagina or Premarin creams, um, there are some uh, systemic hormones, but really when we talk about addressing hormone challenges, uh, the, the localized hormone treatments are the safest and the most well utilized. Um, if you notice that you have an increase in urinary tract infections or yeast infections, it may be because you, you, your pH uh, in the vagina is off and that's caused oftentimes by some of these treatments. Um, and so addressing that would also be really important and can be helpful in the healing and moving forward in your sexual activities. When we think about ways to address um, some of the sexual activities that are, can be more pleasurable, this is true, honestly, for men and women. And whether you are in uh, a same-sex partnership or uh, a, a, a an opposite-sex um, partnership, these are all true. The time of day is really important. And sometimes that means we have to get a little creative if you're going through treatment because by six o'clock, you're probably really tired and you're tired in the morning. So it may mean that you may during treatment have um, sexual play uh, less frequently, but it has to be more intentional and set during times that you feel at your best. So having conversations with your partner or partners about the time of day and what works best for you is really important. Assessing each of your expectations. So having a conversation about 
why you're not as interested or talking about the fact that you're fatigued, but you really want to stay physically close and you want to continue to maintain intimacy is really important. Same with the partner's expectations. What are his or her expectations of your intimacy and or sexual play uh, during this time? And coming to a common agreement is really important. And that's where um, a therapist, whether it's a sex therapist or uh, a social worker uh, or an LPC could be really helpful. Changing sexual positions can also afford for greater comfort with intercourse. And for some women, um, penetrative intercourse just isn't an option for a while while they recover. So uh, mutual masturbation, uh, oral sex can also be uh, an option. Again, if there hasn't been a lot of exploration in your relationship, um, this may provide you an opportunity to think about other ways that you can receive or give pleasure to your partner. And there are great books out there that um, I put in the at the end of this uh, conversation that you can refer back to. Certainly addressing desire is really important. And I want to remind people, oftentimes we think especially when we're young, that desire starts in our groin, that it starts in our genitals. And desire actually starts up here. And if we keep thinking that um, we're waiting to get turned on or to feel turned on, we're going to be waiting a really long time, especially if our hormones have been challenged. So shifting the expectations from it being a body expectation to it being a mind expectation actually puts the power back in your hands. So for men and women who are struggling with low desire or low libido, if we can think our way there, it's amazing what our body will do um, to cooperate with that. I wanna put a caveat in that if you've experienced sexual trauma, this would not be a technique I would use with you because it can be re-triggering, but doing it in the context of therapy may be helpful. So as we think about, just like if I put sexy thoughts in my head, I'm gonna feel more sexy. If I put more sexual thoughts in my heads, I'm gonna be more interested in sex. So timing of day, putting sexual thoughts in our mind, thinking about being intimate, thinking about the success of intimacy can actually al allow for greater success um, and satisfaction in, in intimacy. Another technique for both uh, men and women is sensate focus techniques, where you take the pressure off um, sexual intercourse, again, whether it's oral, anal, or uh, vaginal penetration, and the focus is just on being together and experiencing sensual touch. Oftentimes, especially when couples have been together for a while, you know, they've kind of gotten in a routine, they know what feels good, they know what buttons to push, and they've stuck to that routine for a while. This can allow for some fun exploration. So you would do gentle touching um, for each person, starting with, again, non-sexual areas. So just gentle touching, a stroke and massage of the hands up through the shoulders and all across the body um, and responding to your partner. That feels nice. That doesn't feel good. That feels good. That doesn't feel safe. Again, continuing to just explore what on your body does still feel good to be touched because oftentimes when we get stuck on, I can't get an erection, I can't have an orgasm, my breasts no longer have sensation, we then suddenly become in the thought that nothing works or nothing feels good. And there's so much skin. Our skin is our largest sex organ. Our brain is our most important sex organ. And there's so much to work with that we sometimes forget about. I, I want to just remind you that there are non-hormonal ways to treat hot flashes, as a lot of women complain about hot flashes being the number one challenge um, when getting intimate and or feeling sexy. So address the hot flashes. There are lots of options for you. Again, as I referred earlier, using vaginal moisturizers can be really important. So um, here are some op options for you to consider. You would wanna apply five times a week and you can repeat this one hour before intercourse, but again, using lubrication during intercourse or uh, if you are um, engaging in, in masturbation, using uh, a, a lubricant during masturbation. Paraben-free, is, is important for most people because it doesn't create irritation or itching. So looking at products that are glycerin and paraben-free 
are important. There are organic products available like Good Clean Love that women uh, often report are very um, good and helpful. And there are others that you can uh, use as well. When and if you experience vaginal pain or, or vaginal stenosis, so pain upon penetration or even a palpable or an, an exam by a, a clinician, it's really important that you get an exam by a gynecologist to just make sure that um, you get on the right treatment path. There certainly, again, can be estrogen that can be used for some. Um, Lidocaine uh, can be used if intercourse is an important priority and the pain uh, can't be addressed in other ways. Um, my only concern, and I, I say this again up front, is sometimes there is a recommendation to use lidocaine um, to, to mask the pain. And what I always want to reiterate is uh, we don't want to create more trauma or mask pain that could be addressed. So working with a gynecologist is really important, along with potentially a pelvic floor therapist who work with men and women on pelvic floor strengthening. And that can be a critical um, opportunity to help address some of the vaginal changes. Or for men, if you're having urinary incontinence or other challenges, pelvic floor therapists can be really great. There are also medications like Osfina that can address um, some of the tissue loss or the estrogen, uh, the, when estrogen creates it to be less elastic. Um, this can help with some of that vaginal atrophy. It's not a libido booster. This helps with blood flow. And blood flow is critical, critical for arousal. So again, helping with blood flow can help with healthier tissue, right? When we have injury, we need blood flow to help heal it. Same with um, the, the vagina, the clitoris, and the penis. Blood flow is a healthy and helpful um, need for the health of those organs. Again, a refer to a pelvic floor specialist. And at the end of this, you'll see a, a link for where you can find one. For your reference, again, vaginal dilators are an important tool to use during your treatment. I often recommend women utilize them before, during, and after treatment if they can, just to sustain and maintain um, the strength of the, of the vagina. Again, if you're having sexual intercourse on a regular basis, that can replace the use of dilators. Um, I often encourage if you're if you're embarrassed to go or order them online, um, there's a great website called vaginismus.com that has a ton of information on um, pain with intercourse and they sell dilator a dilator kit there that's really great. Um, if you want to go to a store or you want to shop online for them and it's feeling like ugh this is embarrassing, ask your doctor to write you a prescription for them. There's no harm in that, and it somehow gives us permission to feel like my doctor's telling me to, so I have to, and, and takes a little bit of the embarrassment away. For men, the most common forms of sexual dysfunction in men, again, are erectile function. So that's the greatest challenge most men report. There's sexual bother related to that um, and or other challenges. Um, there's orgasm or ejaculatory disorder that some men report. And for some men, um, both post-transplant as well as um, post-prostatectomy, um, men may report a reduction in penile length. Or if you have, uh, if you've had your hormones impacted, that might also be something that you noticed. But erectile disorder is typically the most common reported challenge that men face during and after treatment. You know, I um, really am so glad medicine has come so far that we have found tools to help with blood flow and to help with erectile disorder because 12 years ago, 15 years ago, we really didn't have something that was as available as Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. The challenge with that is the marketing always, I think, overpromises. And similar to when I talked about, you know, libido starts here, if you're feeling depressed, if you're not feeling confident in your body, if you and your partner are having a distressing time and not connecting, there is no pill that can fix that. And that pill is not going to work if your head and your body aren't in it. So um, although again, they can be really, really helpful, the PD-5s in inhibitors, everything else has to be addressed as well. If you're eager and in a good relationship or in a good relationship with yourself and other things are not getting in the way and it truly is physiological, um, 
they can be helpful tools. But again, assessing expectations and having a conversation with a therapist can be so helpful to be better educated on what the tools and resources are because it may not be that you need a pill to get an erection. It may mean that we need to work on what's up here to help you get an erection. There's always the opportunity to assess expectations and practices with you and your partner. Um, if you aren't able to get as firm of an erection and you're in a partnership with uh, a woman, there are still many techniques you can do uh, that, that can be penetrated, so you can still penetrate a vagina, even if you can't get um, a, a full erection. And again, working with a sex therapist um, and your urologist uh, might be helpful in um, identifying some additional techniques. Addressing some of the core, the root of the challenges. So if it is a challenge related to hormones, seeing what your options are. Can you be prescribed um, hormones? Would a uh, PDA5 inhibitor uh, be helpful? Um, would uh, there be other techniques like a penile pump that could be helpful as well? Um, again, thinking of other comorbidities, is there obesity, are there heart challenges, are you on any other medications, pain medications, heart medications, um, medications for your mental health that could be interfering or inhibiting with a successful erection and or uh, prohibiting or inhibiting your desire for um, sexual intimacy, and that would be something you'd want to talk with your physician about. Um, vacuum devices or penile pumps can be extremely helpful to help with um, obtaining a firmer erection um, and can be used in um, foreplay with couples as part of the um, getting ready for intercourse. Certainly I hear from men often it feels awkward and I don't know that I like it, but it's it, it can be very successful and helpful. If you're on a blood thinner or um, post-transplant, you'd wanna make sure that you are talking to your doctor about the safety of utilizing a vacuum pump or again, a penis pump. Physical therapy, seeing a, a pelvic floor therapist who is a physical therapist that specializes in pelvic floor might also be an option, just as I had mentioned for the women. If there is concerns around incontinence um, and or discomfort uh, with erections, pelvic floor therapists can help address that. If you find that you are you feel like you're getting the runaround or you're not getting um, enough answers from your oncologist or radiation oncologist, ask for a referral to uh, a urologist who specializes in sexual dysfunction and or an endocrinologist so that you can really get a full scope of your of a hormone panel of other options that might be available for you if you're, you're struggling with uh, getting, maintaining, and sustaining um, a, an erection. Again, as um, I discussed, there are certainly options that do help with um, increasing the success of an erection um, and can help maintain or sustain an erection. Beyond the pill and beyond some of the others that I had mentioned, Muse or Caverject, which are injections uh, that are, um, uh, it, it's a, it's like a shot <laughs> in, in the penis can be very helpful as well. Again, it's an immediate, um, pretty immediate reaction to help fill the um, penis with blood and uh, obtain an erection. Again, testosterone therapy might be an option as, as, as well as some other therapies that you and your doctor can discuss. For low sexual desire for both men and women, I've mentioned this a couple times, but I always think it's really important to just recognize that, you know, we all come to the table with different histories. And um, unfortunately, um, having a sexual trauma and or having mental health challenges isn't that uncommon. Um, and so being sure that we are in conjunction with a therapist or a psychiatrist uh, addressing those issues, it will help us be more successful in addressing the sexual health concerns that arise during and after a cancer treatment. If you are in a relationship, um, addressing the relationship issues are also going to be really critical to success in a sexual relationship. It could be, again, identifying expectations of how often there is an expectation around intercourse. And, and maybe you agree that um, there's going to be less frequency 
um, but that you're comfortable with your partner finding ways to please him or herself um, on the times that you're not being physically intimate. Um, there also, again, is the opportunity to re-educate and educate your partner on libido. When I'm working with women who have been thrown into medically induced menopause, one of the things I'll hear from their partners, whether they're in, uh, with a female partner or a male partner, is um, that they don't necessarily trust, and it's not a matter of trusting their partner, they don't trust that their partner is turned on because the cues that used to be there, like vaginal moisture, um, like nipple arousal, have changed. And so having that communication around what is different and how can you know that I'm enjoying this or that this is pleasurable it should be talked about as a couple. And that leads us to needing to be uh, potentially more open verbally about what feels good and what doesn't. And that can be done with sounds. It can be done with words. Um, but oftentimes I know that can be a stretch for some couples. And so um, that's again where working with a therapist can be really helpful is uh, how do you communicate about something feeling good when things look different or feel different? Uh, and then trust that that communication uh, is an honest expression of pleasure. We also need to think about um, how we think about our bodies, right? If we are trying to hide or we're worried about um, how our body feels, that certainly is going to influence how willing or how present we are in any kind of sexual activity, whether it's with ourselves or with a partner or partners. So working on the body image concerns that might come up for you would be really critical in your work with a counselor or therapist or in a group setting. I know in the groups I used to facilitate, body image was one of the common things talked about in my, uh, in my groups. Again, looking for other opportunities that might help with low sexual desire. Um, there is a, actually a former antidepressant that was identified by the FDA and approved for the treatment for low sexual desire in premenopausal women. To my knowledge, it hasn't been approved for use in men, but again, has been approved uh, for low desire in premenopausal pre women. Um, as we've talked about, again, hormone therapy may be an option. Again, important to remember, hormone therapy can address some of the symptoms, but it doesn't necessarily fix what's going up, up on here. Sometimes it can influence it. If we, for example, have been having painful intercourse and then it stops being painful, our bodies are gonna say, oh, it doesn't hurt anymore, that feels good. And so certainly that mind um, shift can be helpful in our pleasure or experience of being sexually inter in engaged with our partner by ourself. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the best tools for, to change how we think, right? Cognitive restructuring, taking a thought like, I'll never be able to feel pleasure again, to my body is different and I can learn ways to find pleasure. Very different, we're taking a negative thought and we're restructuring it to something that can have a positive outcome. That's really important. Also communicating between you and a, a partner or future partners, being open and honest about what some of the challenges are that you face. And then techniques or ways to work around it that might require some creative um, changes in thinking or changes in positions or changes in way of doing things. I often will tell um, couples to try this um, tool. It's called uh, using a fact, a belief, a feeling, and then an action. For example, ever since my cancer diagnosis, you've stopped touching me. Fact. I believe it's because you don't find me attractive anymore. Belief. It makes me really sad that cancer has changed that part of our relationship. Feeling. Now, oftentimes, especially women, and I'm going to totally gender type here, but women are really good at like dropping that bomb on their partner. This, this, and this, right? I have a, I have a fact, I have a belief about, and I have a feeling. What we don't always do, and all of us need to think about, is what can our partner do with that? So then we have to do an action. So ever since my cancer diagnosis, you stopped touching me. I think it's because you don't find me attractive anymore, and it makes me sad that cancer has changed this part of our relationship or this aspect of our relationship. What I would really love is when I come home from work or I come home for treatment, that you would come and hug me and kiss me like you used to. Right? It's an action, a simple action. And then your partner has something to respond to, to, to act to. Now the key is, when our partner or partners actually do what we ask, 
we do not get to go back to them and say, oh, you're only doing that because I asked you to, right? We have to embrace and appreciate and say thank you for doing what I asked, right? They, they paid attention and they're responding. Another piece to address low desire is relaxation training. Oftentimes low desire is affiliated um, with depression and anxiety um, or can be challenged during when somebody is feeling depressed or anxious. So relaxation training, really relaxing the body, allowing the body to be um, in a place of calm, in a place of um, receptivity can be really important. And saying to ourself that um, my body is open and I can do new things is also really important. For performance anxiety, if you're just worried, and I know we got a few more minutes and then we'll get to questions. If, if, um, if we're worried about whether we're going to be able to perform, uh, whether we're in a, a relationship, a long-term relationship or in a new relationship, or whether we're uh, just by ourselves um, and, and masturbating, it's really important to think about how do we release that anxiety from ourself? So if body image challenges are what's causing the anxiety, see a therapist. If, um, if you're worried about, I don't know how it's gonna feel, or I don't know that I can, and if masturbation is um, okay within your religious uh, and cultural setting, then masturbation can be a great tool to help you better understand your body. And I really try to separate masturbation from for pleasure versus masturbation for feeling in control and a better understanding of how your body responds and what it needs. Because I think that's really in this setting, that's the goal, to reduce anxiety, to feel more confident in your body. So knowing what feels good and what doesn't is also really important. And there's another technique I'll use where I say, I want you to take a red and green crayon, draw a stick figure. I want you to use the red crayon to show every part of your body that you know does not feel good to be touched, um, and then the green to show everywhere else that it does. Oftentimes what happens is it shifts that mindset. There may be, you know, a, a red line across a woman's breast because the scars on her chest just don't feel good to be touched. Maybe there is a red line in the pelvic area, but there's so much more of the skin and body that still experiences pleasure. So rethinking again about the experience of pleasure and closeness, um, the ability to be sexually intimate without intercourse, um, whether that's again through other forms of pleasure, masturbation, oral um, sex, uh, just kissing and laying naked. Um, there are lots of ways that we can be sexually intimate without intercourse if intercourse is not comfortable or possible for you. As a reminder, you know, the, predict, the factors predictive of a healthy sexual adjustment in relationships is that good relationship with self and partner were occurring before the diagnosis. If there were challenges, brokenness, um, distrust prior to the diagnosis of cancer, you might experience a honeymoon period, but if those issues aren't addressed, they're going to come back. Um, if you had a satisfying sexual relationship before the diagnosis, there you are have a higher likelihood of being able to work through and find again that common ground, that connection, and finding ways to, to feel and experience pleasure together again. Having support of one another is really important. Your partner's sexual health and certainly a sense of positive sexual esteem, how I think about my body influences how I feel about my body, which again influences my behavior. So if I wake up every morning and the first thing in my head is, oh my God, Sage, you look like that again, you look like your dad. I don't think that's gonna set my day for success. I love my dad. And I do look like him, but but that message to me is negative, right? So if um, if I set the intention of, oh, I look like that again, the message received is something's wrong. It's broken, it doesn't look good. Now, if I wake up in the morning and initially I have that thought and I look in the mirror and I say, today's a new day and I'm gonna do everything I can to help heal and support my body, very different outlook, has a very different impact on the way I feel and think. For those of you who might be facing end of life or um, have uh, an advanced disease, it's really important to focus on what you have control over and have the conversation with your partner or family members, people that you're intimate with, whether sexually intimate or just emotionally intimate, around what you might want. Do you want your partner to be the one that bathes you and you can turn that into intimate time? Or do you want someone else? Do you want your partner to come and lay close to you and next to you, even if you can't be physically intimate? 
it. Having conversations about what is possible instead of what isn't can be really empowering and allow you to stay close and connected because intimacy is so critical. No matter where you are in the lifespan, um, at end of life intimacy is almost uh, one of the most critical things that people have um, in that experience of death. And finally, um, finding a therapist, asking for a referral to a trusted network, whether that's a pelvic floor therapist, a therapist, or um, a sex therapist can be really important. There are great books that Ann Katz, a cancer nurse, wrote, Sex Cancer Man, Sex Cancer Woman. There are many other books out there um, that can be really helpful um, on your journey of exploring and improving your sexual health because it absolutely matters. So talk early and often to your physician or treatment team about some of the sexual health concerns that you might have, even if you're not experiencing them, bring them up, ask them. Give yourself permission to redefine your expectations and allow for your partner to have um, the, the redefinition as well. Remember that um, a dysfunction is, is associated with distress. So if you don't have distress related to um, that dysfunction, it may not be something that needs to be treated. However, I would say that if you ever anticipate wanting to be sexually intimate again, if that's not a priority right now, but it is in the future, doing some of the um, pelvic floor therapeutic work is really important to maintain those muscles for men and women. Certainly having a conversation with a provider can actually be therapeutic and normalize some of your concerns. Um, see a gynecologist, women, you can get on hormone treatment early if possible or um, asking about other alternatives. For men, um, talking to your doctor about erectile disorder is so important and finding out your options as well. And then communication, so important. And as I said, the most important sex organ for humans is their mind. So I'm gonna turn it over to questions. Um, and uh, Kelly, I think you'll be facilitating those for me. Yes. Sage, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we've gotten a good handful of questions. So I'm just going to start running through them and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, sure. Attendees, if you have new thoughts or questions as we are doing this portion of the webinar, continue using that chat, continue using the Q&A um, and send them in to us. Um, okay, so one question we got, and I think you kind of addressed it with some of those links you just shared, but um, just looking for a good uh, recommendation for a gynecologist. Um, they were specific to the Austin area. I know you're not in Texas, but do you have trusted sites that maybe you go and start your search for those? Yeah, so um, for a gynecologist, um, specifically I would look for a gynecologist who, um, who, who states on their website, they take a holistic approach to um, gynecological care, that they're focused on women's health. Um, that's really important. If, if you know, I look for women, for gynecologists who also specialize in aging because they typically have a better understanding of the challenges that young women face when thrown into medically induced menopause or older women face that can be exacerbated by treatment. Um, I'll often, sometimes if I don't know, I'll call one of my sex therapy colleagues and say, hey, who do you work with or who do you refer to? So if you go to the ASECT website, the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors and Therapists, there are gynecologists that can get approved um, as uh, counselors as well. So you might find somebody that is a gynecologist and also a sex counselor, uh, and that certainly would be a good match. Or find a sex therapist, call and ask for a referral to somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this kind of goes along with it, but just in case you have a different answer, I'll read it out. <laughs> um, so after treatment, I saw, I sought out a, pel a pelvic floor therapy, um, also did vaginal laser therapy and expanders. All of those therapies helped. In addition, my cancer was not hormone involved, so I was allowed to start HT HRT. Um, however, once I added testosterone, it caused me to lose hair and I, that I had grown back after chemo. I chose to stop the HRT because of the hair loss um, and more of the challenging emotional side of it. Um, so are there doctors that specialize in helping with these types of hair loss physical issues? I wish there were doctors that specialize in that. You know, I think there are there are endocrinologists and gynecologists and urologists 
who do understand and really, again, take a holistic approach to addressing some of those challenges that people face. And, you know, if, if testosterone caused one problem, there are some options that don't necessarily have testosterone that may help with um, some of the ongoing um, challenges that hormone therapy may relieve. Um, so, so I would say, you know, again, sometimes I tell patients go on, um, chat boards that patients are sharing information on. You know, I know for young adults, Stupid Cancer has a ton of those that people will share who they've seen. Um, asking your oncologist for a, re a referral or reference, asking the, the medical social worker or the oncology social worker for a referral. But it is a challenge. There are doctors, again, who do take a more holistic approach. Sometimes it takes some time to find them. But those are the ones you want to find that will really look holistically at addressing um, some of those challenges. And I, I'm really glad to hear that you were able to get connected to laser therapy and um, use dilators that whoever was taking care of you was either you were doing the direction right or they were directing you right. So it's great to hear. Um, this was just a comment shared. Um, they, their, their experience, um, their oncology physician told them they couldn't have sex during chemo treatment, and it turns out they were able to with a condom. Um, and it would have been helpful to know, know that. Yep. Um, previously, that there are interventions. So it's, she's grateful that you just shared that and. <laughs> So there, and I think, you know, you, you raise a good point. Um, there are some treatments that can cause, um, whether it's the risk to getting pregnant. And so it says don't have sex, which I think is a little extreme. It should say use, have protected sex. Um, uh, but oftentimes what happens is we don't give alternatives because it's not, it's either the pregnancy risk or there's actually a risk of uh, rash or irritation. Um, and so you can with condoms, um, prevent that from happening and you can have intercourse if it's an interest of yours. For oral sex even, you should use a protection. Um, if you're engaged in oral sex, you can wear a condom if you're a man. Uh, if you're a woman, you actually can uh, use what they call dental dams or just make your own. It's saran wrap cut in a three by five card shape that you lubricate on the side that goes on the clitoris and labia and that protects from any um, secretion of the chemicals for example from chemotherapy that could pass to your partner most chemotherapies it's safe to have intercourse on what the worst thing that can happen is your partner would get a rash or irritation so they if you have oral sex they might get a sore throat like an itchy throat it goes away very quickly if you have um, intercourse they may notice that their genitals get a little bit of a rash it's just irritation you don't pass the chemotherapy on to them it's not a risk for them in that way mm. that's a good clarification um we were also asked would you repeat the moisturizers you recommended sure um so there is an organic one called good clean love um, and um, there are, goodness, a handful of them. In fact, on vaginismus.com, there are some um, referrals or references there for uh, moisturizers that are also good. The one that um, a lot of my patients report back really liking is Good Clean Love because it's organic. And for whatever reason, I think a lot of the women I work with um, post-treatment kind of want something that feels a little bit more, is more natural product. Um, but there are, there are, again, lots of, of moisturizers out there. What you want to look for is something that's paraben and glycerin free. Um, so something like Replens that you can get over the counter at CVS. It's a fine uh, moisturizer and many women use it and don't have any issue. Um, but if you don't know if you're going to have a reaction to paraben or glycerin, what would happen is if you use it uh, and you get very itchy or irritable, like uh, the the inside of your vagina feels irritable, uh, it's itchy, that would indicate to you that's not a good match for you. Oh, I do see, you know, really quick, Kelly, in the questions, it was a follow-up to my original question. Uh, my gynecologists go directly to hormones as treatment. Are there more natural specialists that would be more appropriate to talk to about natural ways to treat some of these issues? So, um, you know what, that's a great question. And, and I would say, um, if you know that you don't want to go immediately to hormones and your gynecologist doesn't have other options, you probably want to find a more holistic focused gynecologist because there are a lot of gynecologists that can do non-hormonal. Um, for example, um, the laser therapy is non-hormonal and extremely effective. Um, uh, talking to an integrative medicine doctor 
could also be an option uh, if you're looking at ways that might improve um, your sexual function overall or potentially working with a gynecologist who's willing to work with an integrative medicine doc and marrying those two as a treatment team for you um, certainly could be an option. When it comes to the treatment of um, uh, the vagina, unfortunately, other than moisturizers, laser therapy, pelvic floor therapy, there isn't and, and then therapy, there isn't a whole lot outside of hormone um, prescriptions that are as effective. But those things I just named are all non-hormonal and highly effective. Um, so again, the only challenge is they, they have to be continued to be used to be effective. Similar to hormones, you can't take it one day and it's all good for the rest of your life, right? You have to keep taking them for them to be effective. And when you stop, they stop being effective. But as, if you can keep doing those um using those tools that are non-hormonal related, you'll continue to have success. If you, the one thing I didn't mention, if you have um, low libido and you're looking for something that can create a sensation or increase the sensation of arousal, there are warming creams that can be applied to the clitoris, um, not like the KY, uh, his and hers, um, but there are warming creams that you can find um, on, um, on online that are creams again not oils and the creams last a little bit longer mm -hmm. um and you what you want to know though is if you have vaginal dryness you need to address the vaginal dryness before you do any warming creams because it will burn not feel warm and good so address vaginal dryness before you um explore using creams but that's another natural way to help with your body um feeling the sensation of being aroused Awesome. I'm so glad you saw that question. <laughs> Thank you for looking over oh, yeah. there. Um, and we're just getting more comments saying, um, just thank you so much for your time. You reinforced what they're feeling and going through and you're normalizing them. So they appreciate you speaking today. Um, I just want to thank everybody for attending and participating with us. Again, a reminder, this session was recorded. You're all going to get it in an email from me, and then it will be on our foundation website. Go to the programs tab, and then you'll find Survive and Thrive webinar archives. Um, I encourage you to stay current with our foundation. We are continuing this webinar series. We have multiple support groups. Um, you can like us on Facebook for all updates. And again, always go back to our foundation website. Um, if you have participated in any of our Survive and Thrive programmings, we now have an ambassadors group that you can join. And so in the follow-up email, I'll also provide information for how you can get um, involved in this ambassadors group and just continue having some peer support and peer community. Um, lastly, there is going to be um, a survey included in that email. We would love to hear your feedback. We would love um, to get your input on topics you would like us to have presenters come in, speak about, um, and just what you learned. So please share with us. We always love to hear from our community. Um, and Sage, thank you so much again. We greatly appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank yeah. you so much. Have a good one. Take care.